When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's it, everybody. We are back, and this is the HTML All The Things Podcast. This episode is titled, Where the Fuck Do I Start Learning Web Development? So in this episode, we're going to talk about just that. Where do you start learning web development? There are a lot of sources out there. I mean, we're one of them. Uh, there's a bunch of tutorials, courses, formal and otherwise, meaning you can go to a traditional school, like a college or university or even a high school will teach some of this stuff. You, there's also like paid courses, free courses, random TikToks. The list just goes on and on. And so when you're brand new and you don't know where to go, you're probably looking everywhere and going, there's a lot of material here and a lot of different material here and there's a lot of different sources. So where do I start learning? So we're going to talk about that today. So if this sounds interesting to you and you want to support the show, you can go check us out on that Patreon, leave a review or rating on your podcast app. Join us in our Discord server or share this with your friends. And I would like to note that Scrimba has given us a 20% off coupon available at our link, scrimba.com slash links slash HTML, all the things. It is a limited time promotion that is still being figured out right now because we pre-record these episodes. So the expiry date will be on the show notes on HTML, all the things.com, but the link will be in the show description as well as on HTML, all the things.com. Go and check that out. If you want 20% off, that's where it will be. You can learn web development with their interactive media player code editor. And if the timing is correct, because again, we record these ahead of time, their version two of the site should be up and running and going at full steam with an all new UI UX experience. So go and check that out. Now, Mike, we do have to answer the question still. Where do you start learning web development yeah, absolutely. So I think this kind of came from a lot of questions that I've been getting recently. I, I posted a question on Twitter, as it usually is, is, like, what are the biggest pain points with web development? And I think the biggest one that most people came up with was that they just don't know where to start. Um, and I think we, we've had a couple of these types of episodes in the past. And in fact, I think our first episode was where to start or something like that ever. So th this is a thematical episode that we will kind of continually revisit because I think it changes depending on what state the web development industry is in. So right now we're in a little bit of a more competitive state. I think web development has evolved a little bit uh, over the past few years into a more maybe full stack expectation framework. So this episode will talk a little bit about the front end, a little bit about the back end, how to connect them, what order I think you should learn those things in. It's a very opinionated episode. So take that with a grain of salt as well. It's my opinion. I have learned how to learn. Obviously, I've learned many different things. Um, and this is just the way I would tackle it right now. And other people might do it differently. And that's perfectly fine. You might have already done it differently. I'm not saying you're doing it wrong or you did it wrong. It's just there's certain logical things that I, I'll put into place here that make it make it so that there is a structured way to learn this, right? So if you're going from scratch, if you're just getting into web development right now, hopefully this will help you. If you've stepped already into the industry and you're thinking about where to go, hopefully that will help you. If you're already pretty far in and you think that you've done something wrong, don't. Because again, there are multiple paths you can take. Maybe this will just help you guide the next step, if that makes sense. But yeah, let's talk about those different paths, right? Because before we jump into my recommendation or our recommendations, really, I do want to talk about all the different ways that people can jump into web development and why it becomes a little bit more hectic than we think it is, right? Web development in general, at least used to mostly refer to front end stuff, a lot of times, at least. Obviously, there was a lot of like talk about WordPress, there's a lot of talk about stuff like that. But a lot of times you used to think associate web development with front end. Then it would migrate a little bit to the back end when you start talking about like PHP and WordPress and stuff like that. And that, that was just kind of a side thing that you would use. I think lately it's migrated a little bit more to 
front end, yes, but back end is part of it now, no matter what. Because usually you would have two teams, one handling the front end, one handling the back end, and the, what your web developers would be on the front end. The back end would be usually building not just for web, they would be building for internal systems, apps, and you would just, the front end teams would just connect with those systems, right? They wouldn't be uh, associated with them too much other than just consuming APIs. Nowadays, a lot of things can be done fully on a website. You don't need an app for everything. In fact, your internal front end systems, your admin dashboards can also be done on the web. You don't need like a, you know, a Java app to run on the back end or something like that and or connect to the back end. You can just do everything from the web. So therefore, with the evolution of the capabilities of the web comes the evolution of the skills required to maintain a website, if that makes sense. Now, having said that, there's many different paths to get into web development still. So a lot of times, front end first, right? You go into the front end, you learn your typical HTML, CSS, JavaScript. That's a very common path. And that's one of the steps that I'll be talking about in our recommendations. There is a back end first path. If you're really interested in back end, or maybe you're coming from a back end side of things and you want to get into web development, there's nothing wrong with going, you know, back end first learning a lot of the intricacies of how API, the API layer works, how it connects to the web, caching, cookies, and all that. Going into design and UX. So a lot of times you go into the front end, you realize, hey, I don't really like the code. I like the actual design and UX side of things. So you start kind of doing split, you know, a little bit of coding and a lot of design. That's another path that you could take and that can be pretty successful. I, I, I've had a couple of friends that went through that and got jobs. And then another one that's kind of popping up more and more recently for people that especially maybe uh, bootcamp developers or developers that are just trying to get a job as quickly as possible is jumping right into an opinionated framework like React or Next.js or something like that. So instead of learning, like maybe they have a little bit of coding skills from something previous, uh, maybe mobile development or something. And instead of going the typical route of like learning the core three or the, the three pillars that we recommend, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, some people will just jump straight into React because that's where all the jobs are, right? Or whatever, Next.js, whatever framework that they want to, they want to jump into. And okay, so all of these are paths that people take. There are probably many, many other paths that you can take and a combination of these and stuff like that. But the reality is, is that like, depending on what kind of learner you are, depending on what kind of person you are, the different paths will benefit you differently. Right, A front-end first path, if you're a visual learner, will probably be a better way to start. Right, like If you like to see things happen on screen really quickly, front-end, obviously, is the way to go. If you're more of a mathematical, analytical person, maybe a back-end approach is the way to go. Like If you like to see a core infrastructure, if you like to create logical systems, efficiency, stuff like that, maybe that's the way to go. If you're more of a creative person, right, that makes sense. A design path makes more sense in that situation. And if you're more of a person that's just rushing through as fast as possible, I don't know if it makes sense, but like I've, I've seen it happen and I've seen people be successful jumping into an opinionated framework, right? Without, without learning the core fundamentals. It does, there is some gotchas to be had jumping down that path. Like debugging becomes a little bit harder, like learning the infrastructure of what you're building on top of becomes a little bit harder. Not impossible though. You could still definitely do it. It's just, you know, you'll have a few obstacles to jump through. I will say that in general, we've seen people that if you're coming from a spot where you, you're, you know, you know how you use a computer, obviously, at a basic level, but you've never programmed before, then having a visual reference as to what you're doing is really helpful. Whether you're a creative person, you know, kind of self-proclaimed creative person or not, having a, sort of a programming language, so like front-end stuff, that allows you to, you know, type in some things like adding divs and nav bars and, you know, whatever else. And just seeing that appear on the screen, even if it's just HTML for a while, is really helpful for your basic understanding of what you're doing. Because going from just using a computer to effectively, you know, programming it and telling it what to do and what to display and how to display it is a pretty weird sort of almost like a culture shock. Like you're on the other side of the fence at that point, right? You're no longer just the consumer of things you're creating at that level on a computer. It, you know, even if you're like, you know, I do like logical puzzles, but I'm just not understanding this back end stuff. Like if you decide to use Python, for example, I mean, Python does have UI options, whatever, but with HTML and CSS, which we're going to get into, you have to like right away, you're already working with, you know, code 
that will automatically generate like elements and a, and a web page of some sort, a very simple web page. And then CSS, you know, obviously adds the complexity and then JavaScript really kind of pulls you in to the sort of more quote unquote computer programming side of things, I guess you could say, where you're using more logic and math and those type of things to manipulate that user interface. But HTML and CSS is just a really good way to sort of introduce yourself to it. And then there's no problem with you maybe getting through HTML, CSS, JS, and then being like, you know what, I think I get it now. Like I'm on the other side of the fence and I would prefer to go back to my mathematical, logical puzzles and then go learn something else, right? Whatever it is, I don't care, like PHP, Python, whatever, like something that's more, say, backend logic, math-based kind of thing. Now that you understand generally what computer commands and what coding and syntax and everything just is, just to get your bearings, I find that HTML and CSS just makes a lot of sense for people because they can see something changing right away. It's very similar, if you have any experience in this, to those that will always use or have always used a GUI, a graphical user interface, meaning something like Windows as you know it, as you visually see it, and then someone who goes into quote unquote, the back end of the computer using a terminal or a command prompt or PowerShell in Windows case and using commands and, you know, say making a folder, making a directory and then going visually through the file explorer and seeing it made. People that are always GUI all the time, they don't understand, you know, the terminal. They don't know what it, what's going on. They don't under, understand commands. And again, it's one of those like culture shocks. And so one of the ways that I learned the terminal was like specifically the, the, I guess the bash shell in uh, Linux was that I would create, you know, directories and move things around and read files and things like that. But then I would go and do that also in the GUI and be like, oh, okay, so I made this folder, I made this text document, they're in there. This is just sort of like the commands that are running in the background and just to sort of get my bearings. And, and I feel as though there's a really sort of easy comparison and, con and contrast there to, you know, just having never done any programming and kind of dipping your toe into it with HTML and CSS. It's just, to me, is a really nice transitionary language, I guess you could say, or a couple of languages since it's HTML and CSS. But that that's my piece on that. I, don't, I didn't want it to be long-winded, but I, I just feel as though there's going to be some people listening here that have literally never used a computer from anywhere but the consumer end. I, I, think, I think you brought up a lot of good points. And honestly, like the way you were describing it, kind of flows directly into this next segment, which is our recommendations, because how you did it with, which is like the front end to the back end is exactly how I would recommend others to do it. And again, our opinions, take it with a grain of salt, however you like, but this is what worked for us. And I know it's worked for a lot of other people. And the reasons that Matt mentioned mainly being like the fact that you could visually see stuff happening on the screen right away. It's a little bit simpler to understand HTML and CSS over JavaScript. So like the progression makes sense. And just having that base layer to understand before you jump into the next one. I feel like just being able to interact with something, even if you're a backend developer, knowing how the front end is working so that you can display your backend API calls, for instance, in a better way, it'll make you a better developer by tailoring what you're creating to front-end developers. Because if you've never worked on the front-end, you might give someone a garbled mess that they'll have to parse through and create the, the data structures that they need to be able to display the stuff that they need. They can do that. Front-end developers could do that. And we do that all the time. But the reality is if a back-end developer has better front-end knowledge, they'll probably give you better data to consume and easier data to consume for you on the front-end. It's the same thing with design. If a designer knows front-end development, they'll give you better designs that align easier with the code that you're going to be writing because they know the limitations, right? They know the limitations of a browser. They know the limitations of multiple browsers, cross-browser development. So they're going to give you a little bit more flexibility in the design to be able to adjust to different screen sizes, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas a designer that's strictly a designer that's never touched code, a lot of times is going to be very... Um, they may be very creative, but they, they don't know the limitations well enough to be able to give you perfect designs that you can translate to a website without having to make your own assumptions, right? So it's a give and take here, and I think it's important to understand why that progression is really key for us. And just jumping right into the recommendations is 
just like Matt said, starting with HTML and CSS. Now, these are two languages that have their own complexities. They're not easy in any way, shape, or form, right? Like HTML has a million different elements, semantic HTML. Each element has a bunch of different attributes that you can learn when you need to that do different things. There's different. There's logic associated with HTML nowadays, especially when it comes to forms. There's a lot of built-in things that help you do you know validation and inputs and set like post requests and stuff like that like you can send a form straight from html and that's that's a lot of like it's a lot of power there but there is still a very limited amount like if you go to mdn you know the mozilla docs and type in html it'll give you like a list of all the html elements and then you can click into each one and see what each one can do um, and that's it. At the end of the day, that's really all HTML is, is just a semantic list of elements that you use for structuring your code, your UI. There's not much else associated with it, so it's a perfect start. And when you put an HTML element in a .html file, it will immediately show up on screen. So if you put an h1 tag, which is a header tag, into a file and label it .html and put like test title into in between the tags it will show up on as a web page on a screen with test title displayed in in a larger font because it's a title right so there's these immediate reactionary things you can do that can make a difference to you again back to the visual learning side of things or just like the interactive learning that make it make it make sense and like matt mentioned this matt dipped his toe into it where like when you're first starting out, when you're just a consumer and you get into the next part of it as being like a developer, that initial step seems very big and scary. I remember my first experience with it was HTML. Like my, I remember grade, I think it was grade nine business class or something like that, like, uh, like in high school, where we built out a kind of quote unquote, a little web page, a profile, a portfolio page for ourselves that had like kind of a, a resume that was built in an HTML file. And the first time that I did it, I was like, I was through the moon because again, I, I didn't expect it to be so immediate and so responsive and so quick that I can write something and see the actual output of it on an actual page, right? Like I thought you had to like run it through some sort of compiler and do except like, you know, run 15 different applications to bundle something together and then send it to a server in the space. Like that, that was my initial thought. Like that's how I thought. But when you actually do it for the first time and you realize it's not magic, it's just code, it helps you make that next step, right? And logically the next step after HTML is always going to be CSS because as nice as HTML is in structuring your code, uh, or like showing what is on your screen, you can't style it. It's just going to be very bland. It's going to take whatever the default style of the browser is, and it's probably just going to be in one big column or one big row or whatever. It's going to look like a jumbled mess if you try to only use HTML. Whereas with CSS, you're able to target your HTML elements and style them using sp the specific CSS language, right? Like make, if you want to make that H1 that you just created red, Right, you could do color red, and it will be red in in CSS. Now, there's more to a little bit more to it than that. You have to create a class, you have to target that class, but you'll learn all that when you first take it, like a course or something like that. And I'll get to a course on this later. But there's progression that you do. So you create your web page, create like a little you know portfolio page for yourself, add some styling to it, make it look nice, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you'll understand the core concept of the web. Like what a page consists of. At the end of the day, what is served to your browser, it's just HTML and CSS. JavaScript is the thing that runs certain functions, but the initial output, what you're looking at on the screen, is just HTML and CSS at the end of the day. Yeah, I think like one thing that we should note as well, and it's kind of the elephant in the room that some people are going to hear if they've done research into this, is that HTML is not a programming language, or it is, or it isn't. And there's that sort of, it's almost like a meme at this point where people are arguing back and forth. And, you know, sure, like you could say, you know, it's not necessarily a programming language. Like I know that CSS is a markup language. I believe the same thing goes for HTML because it's hypertext markup language, you know, the HTML. The point of the matter here is, is this is what I've always said is like you're developing a site, though. Like whether you're a developer or this and that, I'm not going to get into like, oh, this is my title. No, it isn't because you don't know how to code. Like 
who cares? Like, these are the tools of the trade right now. Like, using HTML and CSS are the tools of the trade. And if you're using them in an introductory fashion, like I'm saying, just to sort of get on the other side of the, the fence again, to get away from the consumer side, to get more into the programmer side, like, this is what you're going to use even when it when things are more advanced. Like, you're going to use, you know, HTML maybe with Tailwind or, like, another tool of some sort, which I'm not going to get into as an introduction. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. But... Like these tools, like HTML and CSS, like I still use them and I've been, you know, obviously doing sites, making websites for a very long time. I still use them. So these are, you know, foundational skills and whether or not it puts you in the camp of like, yes, I'm a coder. No, I'm not. Or I'm a programmer. No, I'm not. It's markup language, whatever. I mean, these tools, these are tools of the trade that need to be used to make the website, make, make websites work. And that's just basically it, right? Like that's, that's, that's my piece on that is that if you see that conversation online of like whether HTML is a programming language, like I guess you could argue online if you want, but HTML and CSS are still used. It's not like it's something from the 80s that's been replaced and, you know, no one uses it anymore. That's that's foolish. You know, like you still need to know these things. And in my opinion, like who cares about what title you're in? You know, you're still developing a website. You're still developing skills. I mean, they call housing developments developments because they're developing land, right? Like, who? they're not like, am I actually a developer if I'm building 10 houses? Like, you know, who cares about the semantics of, like, of that stuff, especially when you're first getting started? And so th that's something I just wanted to sort of get that sort of elephant out of the room because I know that so many people are going to get caught up in that and be like, oh, I'm not actually a developer because I haven't done that yet. It's like, well, like, I mean... I don't know. I don't really care about that answer, but it's like, but you are just getting started, right? <laughs> like you're not like, I mean, if, if I learned how to change my oil, I'm not a car mechanic. Like <laughs> it's just the reality of the situation. The other part of this is like the chances of you getting a full-time job, just knowing HTML and CSS, I think they're lower and lower these days. I think there was a chance maybe five, 10 years ago, um, because there was these like people that just created layouts and layouts and layouts and layouts and they didn't care about any other technology i think it still exists i'm not saying you can't but just having those two skills might limit you very severely so that's why another reason why you like this is a starting point it's a good starting point and a great one especially if you learn it really well but you do need to at least stretch your arm out into javascript and now potentially into other things and i'll get into them later too now having said that i do have a course here that I'm going to recommend. This is a Scrimba course, it's free. This is a free Scrimba course. It's called the HTML CSS Crash Course by friend of the show, Kevin Powell. We had him on the show a little, a little earlier. And this will run through everything that you need to know really to understand what HTML and CSS is and how to use them. And it'll give you a great starting point. So again, it's on Scrimba. If you go to Scrimba and you just search in the courses for HTML CSS Crash Course, you'll find it and uh, feel free to try it out. Let us know what it's, how you feel about the new player. It's a version two. We haven't even tried it yet, really. And uh, kind of excited to see the audience feedback on that. Now, once you have your bearing in CSS, you can go into a few other things. Like in CSS, there's a couple things. SCSS, which is kind of an expanded style sheet, which allows you to group styles together easily. There's a little bit more logic. Like you can do like CSS logic, more 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 organization, more complex things inside of style with SCSS. That's one way to go about it. You can also try out uh, Tailwind, which is kind of a utility framework for CSS. It's both those things I would say you can almost hold off on until, unless you're really obsessed with CSS, like unless you really, really like it and you know you want to be more front end, then it's probably a good idea to learn a little, a little bit deeper. But I would say that you could probably jump to JavaScript after you learn the core because Everything else will be more relevant to you once you start building projects, right? When once you start integrating with frameworks and stuff like that, then SCSS starts making more sense. Tailwind starts making more sense. It starts to become easier to understand why you would want like all these classes to be these long class names because you're going to componentize everything, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to bore you with the details right now. You'll learn about this when you're learning about the framework side and I'll, we'll get there. So jumping to the next step here. It'll be JavaScript. Again, the three pillars of web development, what the front end of web development runs on is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for the logic layer. JavaScript on the front end is very specifically responsible for doing stuff like interactive UIs. So when you press a button and something changes on the screen, a lot of times that's gonna be done with JavaScript. 
if there's any complex animations like you see on like an Apple site when you're scrolling and it, your scroll is getting hijacked and crazy stuff is flying in left and right and top and bottom, that's going to be done with JavaScript, usually a third-party library like GSAP or something, right? Learning these third-party libraries as you're learning JavaScript, very important because a lot of what web developers do is find code that already exists that's do doing the thing you need it to do and integrating with that code, right? Like building out your own animation library is probably not something you're going to be doing for a long time. So you learning how to use an animation library is a good skill to have. Uh, usually you would want to make a small game or something. You're like a lot of times, you know, doing random JavaScript stuff is kind of boring. Like, you know, making a button create, like pop up a popover or something or a, a modal open or close. Yeah, like that's cool and it's relevant and all that. And it's fun. But like a lot of times you'll want to be engaged. And even for Matt and I, one of the first big projects we did was make a game. And I think I learned 80% of everything I needed to know about JavaScript while making that game, honestly. Like I don't think I've had to learn, really learn much more other than a few like intricate array filter stuff after, after that game. That game really taught me everything I need to know. It taught me local storage, which is like a way to store state essentially in your application so that when you exit, like you, you, you close the browser and come back to the browser, you can have a saved state. Uh, you can be back to where you, you, where you were. It taught me, um, God, it taught me a lot. Any interaction and any dynamic UI creation stuff. So when you click a button and you need something to be created on the screen, document.create elements and inner HTML, all that stuff. It taught me a lot of the core JavaScript fundamental stuff that I needed to know. Some of the stuff that I, I wish I used more was probably learning how to manipulate an array. Like this one, the, learning how to manipulate an array is like 80% of the battle when you're doing interactive UIs because most of the time, the way you receive data is in an array and you're either going to be having to filter that array, you're either going to have to be searching that array, you're either going to have to be reducing that array into like lettuce components, or you're going to have to be interacting, like making sure, like adding up all the elements of the array and doing something with it. Like there's so much manipulation of arrays and lists in JavaScript, uh, especially when you're doing front end work that like just learning that to the, to the fact where you're like, you know it like the back of your hand is going to make you a better developer. It's going to make you really quick. So learn all of the built-in array functionality. Maybe even learn a little bit of how to reproduce it yourself. This leads more into like, hey, if you want to become, if you want to start like practicing for a job, a lot of jobs nowadays especially will ask you to do algorithms. And a lot of that is going to be something to do with arrays. Like here's a bunch of data. How are you going to filter it to do this? Find all the duplicates in this array, like how are you going to implement a function that like a, a loop that will find all the duplicates, put them out and create a new array, like stuff like that. That's typical interview questions nowadays. So again, learning how to implement it yourself, even without using built in methods could be a good way to go down this path if you want to eventually get a job in this space. Now, if you're interested in learning how to like really do this, you know, you can listen to a podcast. That's probably not going to be your the way to go. But there is another Scrimba course that I'm going to recommend. This one is paid. This is the one you definitely want to use that scrimba.com slash link slash HTML the things link for. It's going to be in our show notes. You're going to get 20% off. But it's a JavaScript deep dive course from Scrimba. You're going to be able to code along while you're learning. And another thing that Scrimba actually kind of does that's really cool is they have this uh, folder or this link called projects. And so maybe when you do this JavaScript deep dive course, at the same time, you can go to that projects link, get an idea for something you want to build and kind of build it in parallel. I really like applying skills that you learn to a project that you're internally building yourself, because that makes you think about whatever you're learning a little bit differently, rather than like just regurgitating the same thing that you see on screen. You're thinking about, oh, I I understand this like, you know, document.create element or document on loaded. Maybe I can use that in this app that I'm building, right? So finding something that you want to build alongside learning JavaScript is going to make it easier for you to retain that knowledge and understand it deeply. And that's really what's important about learning anything in this space. You really want to understand it as deep as possible. Understanding it from a high level is probably the biggest mistake that I've done. I should have gone deeper earlier. That's why I, I emphasize recreating some of these array filters and array array methods because that's going to make you understand JavaScript very, very deeply. And and, and like it, it's going to put you at a level much higher than everyone else coming in. I can guarantee you. 
And that's what you want to be. Like the reason that we're doing this episode is because the competitive, the, the landscape in web development is very competitive right now. You need to put yourself on a different level. You need to elevate. To do that, you need to learn stuff deeper than what people are learning. Because a lot of people will learn shallow. That's, I mean, we recommended that a few times in, in previous episodes. We're like, oh, just learn this from, from a high level and go on to the next one. This is the reason that I'm making this episode again is because you need to go deeper. You need to be better this time. I think the the sort of visual aspect too, like, and I mean inside your own mind, um, I know people all think differently, but for myself, like having a project, like you're saying, that you can pull from in memory. If you're like, oh, I need to, you know, filter through these, I need to reduce this array or whatever, that muscle memory of knowing what you want to do with the array or just anything, right? Like creating an element, whatever in JavaScript, to me, I always kind of think of things in a way that pertains to a previous memory. Like, oh, right, you know, back on that project, I had to create like a little modal that popped up. Okay, how did I do that? Sometimes I'll even refer to my old code, but I, I'm getting my bearings and and having sort of like a memory of a project, uh, even if it was just, you know, one time I used it for a little bit, it doesn't have to be some sort of big SAS or anything like that. Those memories of, you know, trying it out and sort of putting my uh, knowledge into practice absolutely like helps me with my recall where I'll be able to go like, oh yeah, like I remember doing it here. I remember doing it there. Um, I remember like where to look even, right? Like if it's been years since I've had to mess with an array for some reason, but I, you know, did six, seven, 10 little mini projects on GitHub in my hundred days of code or something like that, I can go in and, and I know where to look. I know where to look and the code's written by me, for me. So then I, you know, get a little bit of a thing, go like, oh, you know, maybe this is a little messy. I can Google. Like it gives me a jump off point for me to go. And so like having those sort of projects, especially with JavaScript, I find in, in particular, I'm, I'm not trying to say that HTML and CSS are necessarily easy. I know some people will say like, well, they're easy. They're easy. They're easy just because we use them all the time. We use them all the time in every level of JavaScript, in every level of web development. Even Webflow developers are consistently using HTML and CSS knowledge, whether they know it or not. They're, you know, clicking, you know, display flex. They're clicking these different buttons. I know the UI has changed a bit in Webflow, but they're clicking these different things, line heights and sizes and they're using different units, REMs and pic like pixels, PX and, and those type of things. So because it's so exercised, like HTML and CSS becomes easy because it's so exercised and JavaScript, you know, can become that same way. But JavaScript is arguably more complex because you're starting to understand logic. Like I know Mike and I have mentioned logic a few times. If you you know don't know what that means, what it basically means is you're thinking like a computer. You're starting to understand like, OK, I, I don't just like go to the computer and tell it. If the user types in A, you know, show all the A suggestions underneath the input box, there needs to be like literally you have to think of it as like, OK, if user input is A, then create this element and show these things like you're breaking you're breaking down the quote unquote problem is what a lot of people refer to it as you're breaking down the problem of I need all the A suggestions and breaking that down into sort of computer friendly terms. And the real value there is that those logical breakdowns, if you will, assist in multiple programming languages. So, for example, if you want your computer program, your website to make a decision, you're going to use an if statement more than likely. And if you do that, that's called a conditional statement. There's conditional statements in several, if not all of the programming languages out there. And so when you go to, say, learn something else, let's say you get pretty far into web development and you find an opportunity to work on something else, like a desktop app or something like that, you can still take your knowledge of breaking the project down, breaking the problem down, and you go, oh, I know I need an if statement here. How do I do the if statement in you know whatever language it is, in .NET or something, whatever it is? How do I do that? And then... You know, you can go ahead and do it. Like, how do I do it in C? How do I do it in this and that and whatever? And so getting this sort of fundamental knowledge, because again, like we're talking to like, you know, absolute beginners for a lot of this, getting that fundamental knowledge and like really exercising it makes it just like almost like riding a bike, right? Like eventually. And so if you're at this stage and, you know, you're seeing people say like HTML, JavaScript and, and CSS are very, very easy. I mean, it's only because they've been in it forever, and so if you're finding it challenging, yeah, it is. But then once you start understanding it, then you can start going like, okay, now I understand what's going on. 
okay, like, wh you know, what's the next thing? And then you're not scared to look for future things. Like, you're like, I need something that stores multiple items in, in a block. What does that mean? So you're going to learn, oh, that's an array. Oh, okay. And like, you'll start understanding how to Google and you're starting to get your bearings at this, at this point. And then this logical knowledge, this computer logic will apply to the future steps that Mike's going to talk about, like Node.js and Svelte and SvelteKit. That same thought pattern will be used throughout your sort of programming life. Yeah. And it'll come in waves too. That's the other thing about this. So like once you start understanding something, you'll think that you've got it. You'll have this like moment of realization and there's even a chart like I, I can't do this. We're, we're an audio podcast, but the chart is essentially you start really low. Your knowledge starts really low. Your confidence starts really low. And then as you go up, well, your confidence goes up and then your knowledge also obviously goes up. But then as soon as your knowledge hits a certain point, you start understanding everything you don't know. And that's when your confidence starts tanking. And your knowledge still like still is going up, but your confidence starts going down, and then you you end up at like two dips, like two dips and one peak. It's a popular meme. You can like, you can look it up, but like it's a very real thing. Like you'll the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, and that applies to every layer of what we're going to be talking about. Like when we go to HTML and CSS, even there, like you can get confident and then be like, oh shit, what about responsiveness? And then you get that like, you know, stab in the gut from your confidence. So you have to battle that. You have to battle through all of those little dips and dives and only the people that are able to resiliently go through and be okay with not knowing everything, but be willing to power through and understand it pretty deeply are going to uh, be successful. Like that's just the reality of it right now. I'm not sugarcoating anything in this episode. I want you to understand the reality of the situation is you have to you have to be able to battle with yourself almost as much as you are battling with the languages that you're learning. It gets tough. The next thing after, let's say that you're done with the JavaScript, you, you've done the Scrimba JavaScript deep dive course. Again, we'll have all the links to the courses inside as well as the discount link in our show notes. The next suggestion that I have, and this is a little bit different than before, is to jump into Node.js. Now, Node.js is a JavaScript runtime backend server that is using JavaScript, so you've already learned JavaScript, you have something to build on, to build the backend side of things. Now, what's the backend? Well, when you need to query data, let's say that you have a list of users, like your app has a list of users that you need to display on your page. That list of users usually won't live in your HTML files or your JavaScript files. It'll live somewhere in a database, right? It'll live somewhere that's outside of your app, outside of your front end. And to get to that database, you could technically from the front end query that database. That is a possibility that happens sometimes. The problem is, is that if you can reach it from the front end, anyone can reach it from the front end. That's the issue here. So you need to have a layer in between your front end and your database that will essentially connect to the database, take the information, put it into a form that the front end can read and do something with, and then send it to the front end whenever the front end needs it. Right. So that's really like the core functionality of a backend. There's a lot more to it. Like there's authentication on top of that. Uh, sometimes you want to do some like computation heavy tasks on the back end that just can't run on the front end. Like a lot of video processing stuff will happen on the back end because just like you can't offload it to the to the user. You don't know what kind of computer they have. If you need to do predictable tasks, again, one user could have a, a HP computer from 20 years ago and one user can have a brand new MacBook. Uh, you can't rely on that a lot of times, so you have to do stuff in a predictable environment, which is usually a backend server. Stuff like that, that's backend as well. But essentially, from the web development side of things, a lot of it is just interacting with data, parsing that data, sending it to the front end. That's a lot of what you're going to be doing on the, on the back end. And that's what I recommend you do as a next step is now you've learned JavaScript on the front end, learn it on the back end. Spin up a Node.js server locally on your machine, run something called Express on it. Don't worry, don't get into the details of what I'm talking about right now. Everything, again, will be in the show notes, and I'll have a course linked uh, as well that you can follow along and learn through. Like, you don't have to take notes as I'm talking right now. I just want to give you a, a little bit of an overview of what I expect you should be learning at that time. So you want to build a small API that just takes some data 
and serves it to the front end. That's really your goal here, your first initial goal. You, doesn't, you don't even have to have a connected a database yet. You can use one of those fake API services, fake database services, make some dummy data in a JSON file, whatever you wanna do. Make the task for your, for your first task as simple as possible for yourself. Because if you start, you know, okay, you have to connect the database. That's a whole other layer that you have to add on top of learning a backend. If you start having to do authentication, that's a whole other layer. It might be overwhelming for you. So make this like literally serve a little bit of data from backend to front end. That's all you need to do initially to understand the concept. Then again, connect it to your front end. Make sure that your front end can read that data properly, display it, whatever you want to do with that data. Then once you have that confidently built out, I would suggest now learning a little bit of database. Uh, there's a really good like local file database called SQL Lite, which is literally like a file that lives in your directory, your backend directory that runs just like SQL, which is a very popular or SQL, whatever you want to call it. I think a lot of people hate it when people say SQL, it's called SQL. Anyway, if you have just an idea of how to interact with the database, just to like query some basic data from it. That's going to give you a lot of a step forward. Once you understand how, how a database works, again, go a little bit deeper into all these than I'm just describing. Learn how authentication works, because again, the, the main differences here is that you want from your front end to your middle, to your back end and to your database to be fairly secure so that people can't just access your database directly, right? So if you don't have any sort of authentication, if you have no API keys in place, then it's a little bit too open. So you wanna learn at least a little bit of that authentication process. After that, you might wanna have some TypeScript. So like if you're querying data from a database and you're using that data in a certain way, you wanna have an idea of what's coming from your backend, from your database to your backend, and then you can implement a little bit of types. I wouldn't do too much here yet, uh, because you'll probably be learning types as you learn a framework next. But I would at least understand the core concepts of what TypeScript is, of how to use it, of how to infer types from different systems, of how to statically type certain objects. Like just do a little bit of maybe separate TypeScript work here. I actually link a, a course for TypeScript. I don't have one in my show notes right now, but I'll just make a note real quick to, to add a TypeScript course. Because I, I do think it's becoming more and more prevalent where an employer will at least have some sort of requirement for you to understand what it is and how to use it. So I, I'm trying to get you to a point where you can be hired or at least make a very good production app as a freelance designer or a freelance developer. So once you learn all this, you learn the back end, you have a basic understanding of the whole kind of stack for web developers. With this knowledge, you can build almost, I would say, 95 percent of all web development applications, being able to interact with data. So any sort of CRUD operation, like create, replace, update, delete, whatever, any sort of CRUD operation that you can do with them, that's like all web applications. I need to do that. Being able to do any sort of authentication, web applications need to do that. Being able to store data, web applications need to do that. Being able to persist data, all that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have all the tools that you'll need to build anything at this point. Now, the next step after that would be to put it together in a more opinionated way, in an easier to work with way, right? So now you understand that not only do you have the tools, you understand the limitations of those tools. Like you've just built out a really complex JavaScript application, maybe a game in just pure JavaScript. So you know all these like UI management things that you had to do. And once you have that understanding, transitioning to something like Svelte or SvelteKit, React, Next.js, whatever, will make you appreciate and understand the concept of a framework a lot better, right? So when you, when you hit some sort of issue, you're going to have an idea of what that issue is inside the framework because it's, you know, it, you know, at the back end, all it's doing is just manipulating HTML and CSS, interacting with data and all that. It's just doing it in a way that makes it a little bit faster for you to work with. I'll have a course linked for Node.js specifically. Uh, it's a free YouTube course from Brad Traversy. I very highly recommend Brad Traversy stuff, especially for crash courses. There might be more deep dive courses that you might want to do if you have a hard time like getting the core concepts of Node.js. So you might want to create some projects and do, so do more deep dives, but it's not a huge requirement. Like Node.js is something you want to learn as a way to understand backend but it's maybe not something you need to fully specialize in, especially yet, if that makes sense. I do want to point out, too, that if you are listening to this as an absolute beginner, that what was just said is probably going to sound like a lot like gobbledygook. 
but there's no other way to really describe it. And the reason being is just because you don't have as much context, right? You don't understand. Like even when Mike was talking about in the back in the JavaScript section about local storage, you're like, why would I need storage? And like, whatever. What's going to end up happening is, is you're going to, as you practice and as you build things, you're going to stumble upon things like, oh, shoot, I need to like make sure that I track if someone has turned on dark mode so that when they come back to the site, dark mode remains on and it doesn't go back to light mode, which is the default. That may be a local storage use case. And when you Google the light mode versus dark mode problem or use Copilot or whatever, then you will probably find out, oh, shoot, OK, I'm going to do I'm going to use local storage here. And then I'm sure the ideas will start going of what else could you use this for? How much storage is there available? You know, what's acceptable to put in here? What's unacceptable? Is it secure? Is it this? Is it that? Whatever. You know, is it the same as server storage? Is it not? Like, what is that? A lot of the things in this Node.js section are even gobbledygook to me because I just don't deal with a lot of this stuff. I basically do HTML, CSS, JavaScript, site builders, and business admin is basically where I'm at. And then audio editing here and there and stuff like that. So, like, I just haven't touched this part. Mike does this part for our company just because, obviously, split responsibility. Otherwise, I'd be a total madman, which I kind of already am. So, (laughs) at that point. But I just really want to drive home the importance of if this sounded like gobbledygook, it should if you are a newbie. And a lot of this stuff will come naturally. And if it doesn't, uh, as you go through, you will have Googled many things. And then you will be like, oh, well, like, I don't know what TypeScript is. I'm going to look that up. And oh, okay, it's this. Like, do I need it? Do I not? You can kind of make your own decisions and, and your own research because you'll understand how to Google things better. You'll have more context as to what programming is, what commands are and all that type of thing. And so like I just, again, wanted to drive home that importance because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are like, this was supposed to be beginner. Like, what the hell is all this stuff? It's like, yeah, fair enough. And I mean, it should be. It should be messed up because even the easy Node.js stuff is like, you know, level three, let's say. That's the thing. I, I tried to get through it as quickly as possible because I knew it was going to be gobbledygook for 99% of people probably listening to this or 90%. But I did want to under- give an understanding If you're going to go deeper into this, if you want to Google some things, at least you have some basis of where to Google, right? It's very difficult to teach the recommended path without touching gobbledygook because there's just so much of it. And that's why this question comes up all the freaking time is because it's like, what do I do? Like, where do I go to learn this stuff? Because I don't even know what 90% of these words mean. And this is what the point of this episode is, is to to make you understand what it means and to give you a path forward, right? Right. One thing that always like makes me pissed off, actually, as a web developer is if I go to like the Node.js page, and, and I haven't been there in a long time, but if I go to any like a bunch of these tools pages, just the right to their homepage, their description is already too advanced for me to understand. It's like adding user-centric backend commands to things for uncentralized databases of the matrix lols. It's like, what is all that? Like, I'm going to have to use the urban dictionary to, to figure out what the, like, this is just, just ridiculous. So, I mean, I get it. It's just straight up a complex topic, even in the most simple of things, because you're three levels into our little guide here already. So of course Absolutely. it's going to be complex. So, having said that, I think the next part is a little bit less complex because it, I, I think it's like no JS in general, like backend stuff is very complex, but what I want to do is put it all together. And that's what you should be aiming to do, right? You should be able to put together your HTML, JavaScript, CSS, Node.js into one big package. And that's really the direction that web development is going. A lot of these meta frameworks are designed to make it a little bit easier and a little bit more opinionated, a little bit more streamlined to create applications in a reproducible, testable, componentized quick, like just a bunch of different adjectives way, right? Like it's designed to make your life easier. Sometimes it makes it harder, but most of the time it makes it easier. That's kind of a good way to put it. Like sometimes you're like, why would I do this? If I could just do this with JavaScript, it just doesn't make sense. And usually in those situations, if that's really how you feel, maybe you should do it in JavaScript and you might not have the benefit of Svelte or SvelteKit or React or Next.js um, if it's a small enough application. But I'm going to guarantee you that 90% of the stuff you're going to be building for work is going to require some sort of complex UI logic layer that has the ability to do dynamic HTML generation with dynamic content and dynamic data and stuff like that. And that's where this 
what I've mentioned before kind of runs into a wall where you have to really like micromanage every little thing about how your HTML, CSS, how your your website looks and how it is generated and stuff like that. And that's not something you have time for a lot of times. And that's why the next part is going to be talking about frameworks. Now, I'm going to be talking specifically about Svelte and SvelteKit, and I'll explain why, and I'll give some caveats here. Essentially, there's many different popular frameworks right now. I think the big three, or maybe even the big four I'll mention, would be number one at this time would be React and Next.js. Number two is probably something like Vue and Nuxt JS or Vue and Nuxt, right? Number three and maybe three slash four is a tie between Svelte, SvelteKit, and Angular. Those are four pretty large frameworks that do mostly the same thing, okay? They mostly are responsible for doing dynamic UIs, making it easier for you to do dynamic UIs, parsing data, and having a way to interact in, to create backend routes inside of these frameworks. Now, specifically talking about something like SvelteKit versus Svelte and React versus Next, the React part and the Svelte part is responsible for the front end of things. That specifically is talking about only front end. So you're only talking about, you know, doing conditional statements in your HTML, looping in your HTML, doing a little bit of state management from page to page, routing between your pages, uh, stuff like that, very front-endy stuff. The meta framework on top of these, the, the next part of it, Svelte Kit or Next.js, is referring to a thing that ties it together with a backend server that allows you to do like secure routes, secure authentication, secure calls to your database directly from the same repository or the same project in different files, but it's all tied together. They all interact together. It gives you the ability to create a full stack application, a backend and a frontend in one project rather than the typical way of doing it or the previous way of doing it, which would be have a separate app for front end and have a separate app for back end and then connect them with an API or some sort of GraphQL layer, like some sort of layer in between. This kind of puts it all together. So now that you know what front end JavaScript is and back end JavaScript, you'll have a better idea of why you want to use something like SvelteKit. And the reason we're going to be talking about SvelteKit a little bit of a rant, and maybe I shouldn't do this, but regardless, the reason we're going to be talking about SvelteKit and not Next.js because this is the way I want the web to move forward. I personally am opinionated in the sense that I think SvelteKit and Svelte are just a better, Svelte and SvelteKit are just a better way to build front-end full-stack applications. I like it better than React. There's a lot of opportunities in it right now. There's companies like Apple, Amazon, a bunch of companies that are building using Svelte and SvelteKit. Personally, in my company right now where I'm working, we have a, you know, a team of six developers. We're building using SvelteKit for all of our applications. And I think it's becoming more and more popular. And without me pushing it, it's not going to become more popular. Without other people pushing it, it's not going to become more popular. So that's why I'm doing this. Having said that, the caveat here is that Next.js, React are still the most popular frameworks. If you look at your job board and you see a million React app jobs and Next.js jobs, it's up to you which way you want to learn. Everything that I'm going to be talking about Svelte is very directly applicable to Next. And that's another reason that I am going to be talking about SvelteKit because first of all, it's easier to learn. So for people that are already overwhelmed with all this, diving into something like Next might be a little bit too much. If you learn one of these frameworks, any one of the four that I mentioned before, it's going to be easier to learn the next framework and integrate and go from one to the other and dive deeper into whatever. It's just, yeah, a better a better onboarding route for me and for people that I've worked with before has been going into this felt kit side. Having said, yeah. I mean, we could even say at this point, like, since this is, you know, level four, let's say, step four, I think it's safe to say that you're going to be pretty opinionated. Like the listener right now, you're at this point, you're going to be pretty opinionated. And so Mike is giving his opinion throughout this whole thing, but this is the most opinionated piece because you might go, you know what? Like, I really like what React is doing because you have an opinion on stuff like that now. And so you might go, well, the heck with this Svelte and SvelteKit thing, I'm going to go to React. Or you might say, I want to get a job in this. I like it now. 
where my what are the jobs in my area doing? Oh, they're using Nuxt. Okay, I better go do that. Or they're using just Vue. I better do that. They're using Tailwind. I better do like whatever, like whatever tool. Like you at this point know a lot, right? You know the basic front end, the vanilla stuff. You've learned some back end stuff with Node.js. So now you're like, okay, where do I go? And that might be what like you know tier four really is. And like you know, Mike obviously gave his opinion, and that and that's fine. I learned a bit as felt and spell kit, and like that was fine too. Like I enjoyed, I enjoyed working with it. I got spun up pretty quick with it. So I agree with Mike that like maybe this is the way forward. I'm not super opinionated on it though, of course. But this is you know really kind of a, a pick your own adventure. Maybe at this point, you could almost think of think of this as is like. If you really do not want to do Svelte, then don't, you know, don't just learn Svelte. Like if you want to get a job and all the jobs in your area, all the jobs that you want to apply for remote or otherwise are all React. And you're like, well, Matt and Mike said to learn Svelte and Svelte. So I'm going to spend, you know, two months or something learning Svelte and Svelte kit, and then I'll go learn React and delay my application process by two months. Don't do that. Like at this point, it's like, okay. I want to go learn something, you know, that I need for a job. Maybe, you know, scratch the Svelte and Svelte kit, go to React. Yeah, exactly. Make make the decision yourself here, but I'm going to talk about SvelteKit. I'm going to talk everything that, again, everything that I talk is going to apply to the next JS and React. I would start with learning Svelte, obviously. Again, the front-end approach. You learn the front-end first. You learn the, the base framework that the meta framework is based on, and the meta framework in this case is the SvelteKit. Learn Svelte, learn the basics of it, you know, conditional, looping, uh, templating, state, reactivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into it because, again, just a bunch of gobbledygook to you that's learning this right now anyway. I'll have a link to a course that I'll suggest in here that will teach you much better. And once you go through the first three steps, you'll understand what I'm talking about much better as well. Next, after learning Svelte, I would jump into Svelte Kit, learn how this front end that you've just created can connect with the back end all in the same project, how you can do like these shared layout routes, how you can share data between different components, et cetera, et cetera. Again, a lot of gobbledygook, but understand that this is the glue that keep, that puts a front end and a back end together. The beauty of these frameworks is also in the deployment of them. It's very simple for you to go to a service like Netlify or Vercel and connect your GitHub repo that houses your SvelteKit app and it'll automatically deploy and then do this merging of like the back end and front end for you. You don't have to worry about deploying the back end and front end separately on two different services on two different uh, servers or in other situations, deploying it on one server and connecting them manually, um, which is also kind of a pain. All that's managed for you in these managed deployment frameworks. There is like a self-hosted managed deployment framework called Coolify that mimics what Vercel and Netlify do, but you can host it on your own server, which is another option that I'm kind of exploring lately because you don't want to be reliant on a third party as much anymore with parties increasing pricing, you know, going out of business, whatever. You want to be able to do this yourself. Now you have a way to do that with something called Coolify. Again, this is all a bunch of gobbledygook, but understand that I'm trying to make you understand what, what this full stack thing actually means. Now, in this situation, in this case, I think at the at the end goal of the Svelte and Svelte Kids section is creating a full stack application. We talk about project-based learning. This is really important. As you're going through all the other steps, one, two, and three, you should be building projects. A lot of these courses that we have are going to be project-based. But as you're here, this is where it's even more important. You want to really build something that you can be proud of because the next step, step five, which I don't really have documented here, but step five will be starting to build out your portfolio, your online presence, and making sure that you are applying to jobs. And when you're applying to jobs, something that they're going to be asking you about is your previous projects that you've worked on. This is that those flag, that flagship project you want to talk about. You want to talk about, hey, I designed the system that has a front end, that has an API layer, that does create, you know, CRUD, any CRUD application, that has a database. You're able to auth into it, like you're able to log in and access your database securely. It has a component library that I was able to create and reuse components throughout. And maybe if you have time, you know, I have these analytics platform that I'm using, third-party integrations, a nice design, whatever bonuses you want to put onto that application. But you really want this to be a really good application, one application, right? Something that's not just a copy paste of a course project, something that you're more invested into, like, you know, Something that's more for you, maybe for a previous job that you had that you can make something a little bit better, uh, a hobby that you can integrate into this application, whatever you want to do, an idea that really resonates with you that you can talk passionately about in an interview. 
right? That's the key here. Like you want to be able to sit down in front of someone and be like, okay, I built this. This is what it does. This is who it targets. This is how it works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You want to be very passionate, very confident about that discussion. Now, like whether one application is enough to get a job or not is a question mark. Usually you want to build one, like one to three. But if you have one really good one that actually like is deployed and is, has maybe even has some users, that's going to put you ahead, right? That's the thing you want to really focus on is just create one. If you have one, you can create another one later. It's fine, but really focus on the one. And that's really it. Like that's where to start. This isn't the, how do I get a job in tech episode, but this is where you're going to start. And once you learn these four steps and once you get to the next step, which is again, trying to do everything you can to put yourself ahead of everyone and get a job, this is going to be your foundation. And I think that this as a foundation is going to put you ahead of everyone that's going to be jumping in. If you have the core knowledge of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Node.js, and then a meta framework, like again, SvelteKit, Next.js, doesn't matter. But if you have that and you have deeper knowledge of that, I should be very clear here, not just you know high level, it's going to make you very hireable. And I think there's something to note in here as well. This is not the, you know, like Mike said, the get a job podcast, but you don't need to know all four of these steps in order to work. Obviously, I don't know all four of these steps too well. I'm informed of them, obviously, having done this podcast and such, but I also, you know, work for, again, small to medium businesses and things like that. So if you're you know going to follow this procedure and you want a job specifically at the end of it, you are still sort of marketable, like your your skills are still marketable to the job market at least as of recording this, when you're not done all these steps. So, you know, make sure that you check and see, you know, hey, maybe I can go on a freelancer board or maybe I could, you know, very quickly learn a, a page builder or something like that with my newfound knowledge of web development as well and even enhance some of those features and I could get a job that way and those type of things. We have tons of other episodes that talk about, you know, getting a job and this and that. So I'm not going to, you know, go further into it than that. But just... If you are you know, brand new, maybe go and check out our back catalog of episodes because there's tons of them talking about how to get a job and finding jobs and those type of things. But I think, Mike, I think that concludes this episode. We have learned where the F do I start learning web development. So hopefully this episode has really helped you out. And a reminder that we have a 20% off coupon going with Scrimba right now. That's scrimba.com slash links slash HTML all the things. And they are currently, we are currently working on when the promo uh, will end. So that information will be listed on htmlallthethings.com in this episode's show notes, of course. So if you want to use that link to support the show, you can go and do so. And if you want to also support the show via Patreon, you can do that via patreon.com slash htmlallthethings. And many thanks to our $3 tier patrons, Tim from the Web Hacker on the webhacker.com, Jason from Geek Life Radio via geekliferadio.com, Garrett Segull. Level Up Financial Planning via www.levelupfinancialplanning.com, Joshua via silvio.us, and Magnus from YesWeb via yesweb.se. We'd also like to give a shout-out to Michael LaRocca, a contributing author on htmlallthethings.com. Michael is the author of Self-Taught, the Next Generation blog at selftaughttxg.com. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on, and this outro will sign us off. Been listening to HTML All the Things Podcast. Web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that we talk to you like human beings. And we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML All the Things. And on Twitter at HTML Everything. Until next time, this is HTML All the Things signing off.